John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon, near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has a bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives a spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I think that at some point in life, every single person asks this age-old question, how do I enter the kingdom of God? Or maybe more simply, how do I enter heaven? And the thing is, all sorts of different answers have been given to that one question. Some people say, well, if you, if you offer a prayer to a specific God on a specific day in a specific place, then you can enter the kingdom of God. Then you can enter heaven. Uh, an example, that would be in, in the Hindu religion. That's, that's uh, one of the requirements necessary to enter heaven. Others might say, well, you certainly need to be baptized to enter heaven. Mormons would, would be ones that would say that. Uh, probably the one that's most familiar to us is, well, if... If the good outweighs the bad, if you're an upright, uh, good person, if you've lived a wholesome life, then you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, those are just a few of the different answers that are, are given. And with all these different answers, 
we need to ask ourselves, which, which answer is correct? How do we truly enter heaven? You know, I think the world wants to get to the bottom of this. How do we enter heaven? Well, I think to find that true answer, we need to look to the source. We need to look to the one who came down from heaven to earth to tell us how we can enter heaven. And so that brings us to the text that we just heard in John chapter 3, where we see Jesus, who came down from heaven, respond to Nicodemus regarding how to enter the kingdom of God. And specifically in verses 1 to 3, we see that uh, see what it is that is necessary to enter the kingdom of God. Or, or put another way, what credentials are needed to enter heaven. And so this is where we're first introduced to this, this person, this character, Nicodemus. And uh, he comes to talk to Jesus, and he comes at night. Now, a lot has been made about the fact that Nicodemus comes to talk to Jesus at night. Some people say that Nicodemus came at night because he was afraid. He was afraid of what others might think of him if he came to, to talk to Jesus because uh, different religious groups and things were kind of starting to scratch their head a bit when it came to Jesus. And so some people say, well, Nicodemus was clearly afraid. He was ashamed of the fact that he was going to see Jesus. And so that's why he went at night. Well, others might say, well, I don't know if Nicodemus was afraid. I think more so he wanted an opportunity to talk with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. Because during the day, there would have been many people surrounding Jesus at all times. You know, he was healing people, he was teaching. But at night, then maybe that's why Nicodemus went. So he could have a one-on-one -on -one genuine conversation with Jesus. Now, I think that maybe both of those things have a little bit of truth to them. I think there might have been a bit of fear that Nicodemus had, but I also think he did just genuinely want this one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus. But regardless of, of which one is correct or if either are correct, we do know that Nicodemus comes to talk with Jesus at night. And, and what does he say? Well, basically, I would, I would sum up what Nicodemus says in, in verses 1 through 3 as this. He basically is saying, Rabbi, Jesus, you must be from God. Right? That, that's basically what he's saying. He's saying, I, I've heard your teaching. I've heard about your, your miracles, your signs that you're doing, and I, I maybe have even seen some of them. And, and I'm confident that certainly you are sent from God. God. You are from God. And so by saying that, by saying uh, that sort of thing to Jesus, there's kind of a, a bit of an implication that's there that Nicodemus is making. There's a bit of an implied question that Jesus knows is on the heart of Nicodemus, and he'll end up responding to this implied question in a bit. But basically the question is this. I think Nicodemus was wondering, Jesus, if, if you are sent by God, what can you tell me about God's kingdom? What can you tell me about heaven? And I think Nicodemus is wondering all of this because he's looking forward to being there, of course, right? He's looking forward to, to being in heaven. After all, uh, Nicodemus had lived a good life. Actually, scratch that. He, he'd lived a great life by all accounts. And he he should have all the credentials necessary to enter the kingdom of God one day. You know, let's just take a little bit of time here looking at, at verse 1 specifically and see what some of these credentials Nicodemus uh, had are. So if we look at verse 1, we see right away uh, that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Now, I think we've probably all heard about Pharisees if we've been coming to church for any period of time. And Pharisees almost always get just a terrible rap, right? And I think lots of times that's for very good reason. But there are aspects of, of the Pharisees that I think are actually really quite admirable. So yes, it's true that the, the Pharisees were religious higher-ups. They were kind of, you know, the, the up-and-ups in the religious world uh, in, in Israel there. But they had a huge zeal for obedience, specifically obedience to God's word, to God's law. Nothing wrong with that. It's great to have a zeal for obedience, right? 
And, and the Pharisees vowed to follow the entire Old Covenant law. Uh, that's a, and that was a tough thing to do, to, to follow the Old Covenant law. It was extremely difficult. And because they had this zeal for obeying the law, they actually added man-made laws on top of the laws written down in God's word, just so that they wouldn't even get close to, to breaking any of these old covenant laws. And so basically, the, the Pharisees, they lived according to the strictest possible religious rules, but they did it for, hopefully, a good purpose. They were zealous for obeying God's word. And that's admirable. That, that in itself, that motivation is a good motivation. And if we think about that, and, and we consider Nicodemus, that means because he's a Pharisee, because he has, has this zeal for obedience, he would have been a very morally upright person, right? With someone like Nicodemus would not have had this, any scandals. He wouldn't have had any skeletons in the closet, so to speak. You know, on the outside, everything would have been looking great. It, it would have looked really, really good. But as verse 1 tells us, not only is, is Nicodemus a Pharisee, he also seems really sincere, right? He's coming to Jesus and asking Jesus kindly, respectfully, privately about religious things. He seems to genuinely be searching. He wants to learn. For, for Nicodemus, being a Pharisee, I don't think was about being better than everyone else. It was about genuinely searching, about genuinely learning more about God. He wasn't seeking to be better than anyone else. He just wanted to know about God. And it seems to me that he is a very genuine person. So that's, a, that's another check, right? That's another credential. So he's a Pharisee, he's genuine. And if that's not enough, we also read that Nicodemus is a ruler and, uh, and or a leader of the Jews. So this means that Nicodemus was more than likely a member of the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin was the really big up and ups in the religious world. So you've got Pharisees, some other groups like the Sadducees and others, and uh, many of those men who were part of these different groups, the higher they were, they'd end up kind of being in the Sanhedrin. And they were like the, the teaching leaders, the rulers uh, religiously of the Jews. And, and that's what Nicodemus was. He would have more than likely been a top teacher in the land. It's, it's very likely that Nicodemus was one of the people that other teachers would come to for advice. He was like a teacher of the teachers. So clearly then, Nicodemus has some serious credentials, right? So certainly he'd enter heaven, or at least that's what he's thinking. And that's why he's so curious. That's why he's so excited to talk to Jesus about the kingdom of God. Because he's going to enter it. Or so he thinks. But despite all of Nicodemus' credentials, Jesus bursts his bubble. I mean, Jesus does it kindly, but he does burst his bubble nonetheless, as we see in verse 3, as he gives his response as to, uh, you know, how do we enter the kingdom of heaven? Verse 3 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In a, in a very kind way, in a nice way, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, listen, your credentials are not enough. Your credentials could never be enough. Jesus is saying when it comes to entering heaven, it doesn't matter that you're zealous for living a good life. It doesn't matter that you're, you're doing your best to be sincere. It doesn't matter that you're a Pharisee. It doesn't matter that you're a well-respected teacher. And on and on and on we could go here. Those things will never be enough, Jesus says. Why? Well, because Nicodemus, he was dead in his sin. Yes, he looked good. Great, maybe even, from the outside. But the inside was a totally different story. And Jesus knew that inner reality that was inside Nicodemus. If you have your Bible, uh, you can just go up on your page to John chapter 2, verse 24 to 25, which says this, 
But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus knew what was in Nicodemus, and he knows what is in all mankind. He sees through the good works, he sees through the facade. And what does he see? He sees sin. And, and Jesus knows that that's, that's man's very nature. All of mankind is dead in their sin. As Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, And you were once dead in your sin and trespasses. All of mankind. And Jesus sees that in us. Jesus sees that in Nicodemus. Jesus sees the rebellion against God in each of us which has caused a chasm between man and maker. Because, because of sin, there's no longer right relationship. There's no longer right fellowship between God and man. So there was no way that man could fit himself somehow into God's kingdom. The good works, all the credentials that you could have in the world would never be enough to enter the kingdom of God. But what does Jesus say is necessary to enter the kingdom of God? He says you must be born again. You must be renewed. You must be remade. You need to be reborn. To enter the kingdom of God, the necessity is new birth. It is the one and only necessary credential, being born again. That's how you enter the kingdom of God. Now, <laughs> take a step back, you know, and think about this for a second and imagine Nicodemus's face when he hears Jesus say this because, you know, he's thinking, I'm good to go. Like, I just wanted to find out a little bit about heaven. But now he finds out to enter heaven, you have to be born again. I'm thinking he was just like, what are you talking about, Jesus? In fact, we kind of see that's exactly what he's thinking. Verse 4 of chapter 3, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, basically he's asking the question, um, how? How is this supposed to work, Jesus? How do I get born again? Well, that question, that question of how, leads to Jesus describing the nature of the new birth in verses 5 through 21. And first, Jesus explains that this new birth is not a natural birth, which is clearly what Nicodemus was thinking about. No, it's not a natural birth. It is a supernatural birth that comes from the very Spirit of God. As we see in verses 5 and 6, when Jesus answers him, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So clearly, if we consider those two verses, Jesus is speaking about a spiritual rebirth. You must be uh, born of water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus says. So by saying that, he's referring to the regenerating activity of the Holy Spirit. He's pointing to the spiritual seed, to the spiritual origins of this new birth. The point that Jesus is trying to make here it is clear. It's, it's simple. This new birth that he's talking about is a spiritual birth. And God is the one who's responsible for bringing it about. Born of the Spirit, it says, is Spirit. Now, I think most of us probably remember a time or experience in our life when we first see a newborn. Uh, whether that's your own child, a niece, a nephew, grandkid, friend, sibling, whatever. Um, you know, but but when, when you see a newborn, I think to some extent everyone has uh, the same thoughts, the, the same feelings when they see a newborn. Now, I know not everyone likes, likes newborns. You know, some people are maybe like, ooh, like wait till they're six months and then they're fun. Uh, but regardless, if you see a newborn, there's almost always some level of excitement and some level of of joy when you see a newborn. You know, why, why is that? Well, it's because when you see a newborn, you see new life. 
Seeing life is a result of birth. That's true of, of physical birth, but that's also true of spiritual birth. Birth that is of the Spirit brings about spiritual life. It brings about eternal life. And life is just what we were in, in need of before this rebirth. Right? Because as we summarized before, all mankind, we like Nicodemus, have an inner problem, a sin problem. We're dead in sin. We're dead spiritually. But Jesus is saying here, you can be born again spiritually. You can have new life. If we're born of the Spirit, we're no longer spiritually dead, but rather we're alive because this new birth brings new life within us. And as it brings joy to us when we see new physical life, when we see a newborn, so it should also bring us joy when we see new spiritual life. Now, the exact minutiae of how this life comes to be and how the Spirit actually makes us new, I don't know if we can be 100% certain about it. And Jesus kind of alludes to this as well in, in verse 8. It's hard for us to know exactly how this all works, how this new life comes to be in us. Verse 8, Jesus says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We all know there's some level of mystery with the wind. We can't see the wind. There's no way to really find the wind's origin, so to speak. We, we can't really even predict where the wind will blow. We can, but to, to do that perfectly is impossible. But we know that the wind's there, even though we don't see it, even though we don't know its origins. We can see great evidence of the wind. We can, we can feel it on our skin. We can, we can hear and see the leaves rustling in the trees. Well, in the same way, we don't get to visibly see the Spirit's work in, in bringing life to the inner man. We, we don't see that. We, we can't fully understand the mystery of regeneration. But that's okay. Because we still can know, just like we know that the wind is there, we can know that the Spirit is working and that the Spirit brings new life. And not only that, we can simply just be confident that Jesus knows what he's talking about. In verse 11, Jesus tells us that he's bearing witness about that which he knows, about that which he has seen. That's fine with me. If Jesus says this is good, and he says he's seen it, I'm willing to believe it. And verse 13 also clarifies that Jesus can speak authoritatively about being reborn, about heaven, because he's come from heaven. So certainly he would know what he's talking about when he says all this. So even though we maybe don't know the, the minor details, because of the Son of Man's testimony, because of Jesus' testimony about these things, we can still be confident knowing that the Spirit is working in bringing new birth. And that birth is the one way to enter the kingdom of God. Now, of course, with all this in mind, there's still a question that remains. How does one become born again? You know, we, we know that this new birth comes from the Spirit of God, but, but how do we obtain that new birth? What are the means of the new birth? And I think we see the answer to that in verse 14 to 15, where Jesus is using an example from, from the Old Testament, an illustration to show us that the means of the new birth, well, it's, it's really quite simple. Rebirth happens by believing. So let's look at verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So Jesus here is referring to Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9, which I'd encourage you to read uh, later on for yourself. But basically what happens in Numbers 21 uh, is this. The sin of the nation of Israel is on display once again. You know, what else is new? They're complaining. They're saying, you know, why do we have to die out here in the wilderness? Man, man, man. Um, and well, what does God do? He, he's had enough of their sin. So he sends fiery snakes as a just punishment for their sins. And, and when they get bit, they die. Serious consequence? That is the consequence. That's the consequence for their sin. Ultimately, it's death. But God also made 
a way out. See, God commanded Moses to lift up a fiery snake on a pole. So that way, when any of the Israelites looked on this snake, they would, they would live. So that means that the Israelites, they had to trust. They had to have faith. They had to, what's the word? Believe. That looking upon this bronze snake on a pole that, that Moses had set up would heal them. Literally believing, back in, in Numbers 21 for, for the Israelites, believing was the difference between life and death. And I think that's just an excellent picture of what it means for us today to believe as well. It shows us the significance. We obtain the new birth. We obtain eternal life by believing. And it is a matter of life and death. Not only this, but this actually is prophetically pointing ahead to the death of Jesus, this illustration. When Jesus, of course, is hung on a tree. And it's... It's because of that that we are given this opportunity to have new life. And this, this whole idea of believing of, of Jesus' death uh, is made even clearer in what is, I would say, most certainly is the most famous, the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. It's probably the, the clearest and most concise explanation of how we enter the kingdom of God in the entire scriptures, and that is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. How can we enter the kingdom of God? Well, we can enter because God so loved the world, as we read there. Not just some, not just the Jews, not just the religious higher-ups. The world is who God loves. See, God is love. It's, it's a part of his very character. And he shows that love to the world. So much so that he's given us a gift. Or maybe better stated, the gift See, we, we can enter heaven because God has given us the gift, as we read there, of his only son, Jesus himself, to be lifted up on a tree, just as the bronze snake was lifted up on a pole years, years earlier. God gave his son as a gift to atone for our sins, to take them upon himself, becoming sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become new creations, that we might be born again. That's amazing. That's such good news. And the verse continues, we can enter the kingdom of God when we believe. And that's the key, when we believe that that is true, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. When we believe that we're wretched sinners in need of a Savior, and that Jesus, the Son of God, is that Savior who atoned for our sins by dying on the cross, we can enter the kingdom of God. No longer then are we dead. No longer will we perish, as the verse says. For when we believe, we've been given eternal life. John 3.16 is clear, it's concise, it's simple. But it's so rich with this wonderful, saving truth. And I love how it's summarized by, by Max Licato. He says this about John 3.16. He loves. He gave. We believe. We live. So that's just a, a great summary of what it means for us to obtain the new birth. Well, as, as the passage continues, we see more information about the nature of the new birth. And that is that the new birth saves those who believe from condemnation. Verses 17 to 21. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. I think it is a little bit helpful in understanding these verses to understand a little bit of the historical context that was going on at the time. See, many Jews during the time of Jesus were looking for a ruler, looking for a king to condemn. Specifically to condemn the Romans and to, and to liberate the Jewish people from, uh, from their oppression. And some even looked to Jesus to be that king, to be that ruler, as you can read about in John 6.15. But this passage makes it clear that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't need to come condemning the world because as we read there, the world was already condemned. The world was, was condemned to hell because of their sin. Now, I understand that that's a, that's a harsh reality, but that's a biblical reality. Death Hell, a, a place of eternal conscious torment, that's the price of sin. That's the consequence. Romans tells us the wages of sin is death. That's just the truth. But Jesus' purpose was to come and to save the world from this condemnation to hell. You know, some have, have taken that to mean that certainly that means that all people are saved from hell. But does the fact that Jesus died to save the world mean every person is actually saved? No. Because as clearly stated, it is those who believe that are not condemned. But those who carry on in their human nature, who carry on in their sin and, and in their unbelief, well, they are condemned because they do not believe. It's sad, but it's true. As Jesus is kind of, as this is kind of saying here, some, some people, even when they're faced with the light, the very light of Jesus, they still prefer the darkness. They, they love the darkness. They love their evil works. They refuse to be shaken from their, their comfortable sinfulness. And so they condemn themselves to, to right and to just punishment, to death, to hell. To refuse God's gift to us is to be condemned. But to accept God's gift, to believe, is to be saved. And that's the very nature of the new birth. Well, as we approach the end of the chapter here, uh, there is a little bit of a switch, it seems. All of a sudden, it's just this conversation ends and, ends and all of a sudden, it's talking about John the Baptist. You're kind of like, what? What? Um, but we see that this all actually connects with talking about the new birth, even though we're, we're looking at John the Baptist now. And we could say that John the Baptist is one who is the narrator of the new birth. So in verses 22 through 26, we can read about Jesus and his disciples baptizing in the Judean countryside, while John the Baptist and his disciples are continuing their ministry of, of baptism as well. So whether it's due to jealousy or confusion, we're not really sure, but a disciple of John appears to be very concerned that so many people are going to Jesus. As verse 26 would tell us. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, Jesus, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. So there's this level of concern. Why are so many people going to Jesus? Let's look at the beginning of John's response, though, and, and just see the humility that he has. Verse 27, John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony, as it says there. So John the Baptist's response here is in immediate and, and uh, it's an immediate justification 
of Jesus' success. After all, John the Baptist knows his role. We saw back in chapter 1 that that John's role is to prepare the way for Jesus, and he gives testimony uh, that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's no different now. He's he's still bearing testimony about Jesus, even though Jesus has, has now been teaching this radical doctrine of new spiritual birth, still John says, yep, Jesus is the guy. I'm still leading the way here for Jesus, you know, preparing the way. And as he illustrates in verse 29, he says, Jesus is is the bridegroom. It's not about me. I'm not the bridegroom. Jesus is. I'm just a friend. I'm just maybe the best man or something, you know. Jesus is the bridegroom. And I, John, have great joy in Jesus' success because it's about him. He must become greater. I must become less. Again, an excellent example of humility there. And as we go on here, we see Jesus is greater. In fact, he's above all. As Jesus previously stated, he descended down from heaven. And now John confirms that truth by saying, yep, Jesus came from above. Jesus came from heaven. And if you came from above, you are above all. John is testifying that Jesus is who he says he is and that his words about the new birth are true. And Jesus just goes, uh, sorry, John goes on to affirm that even further and says, yep, Jesus is the one that brings new life. Verse 33 to 36. Whoever receives his testimony sets a seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Basically, what these verses are doing, we see that that John is narrating, he is corroborating what Jesus has already said about the new birth. Verse 33 to 34, he's saying, to accept the words of Jesus is to accept the words of God. And, And to do that is to accept that God is true, that God is not lying about the new birth. Uh, We also see that the the gift of new birth here, John is saying, it comes from the Trinitarian God. We kind of see this in what Jesus said before. I didn't didn't touch on it very much. But we see throughout this chapter that the new birth comes from the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. John says it. Jesus says it. The Trinitarian God of the Bible is the one who saves. No other God can. No other God can does. And that's of huge importance. That's such an important Christian doctrine to remember. Uh, the Trinity and also that all three persons of, uh, of God are part of, of saving us, of par- are part of bringing about this new birth. Well, and finally here we see that John narrates that it is belief that is necessary to obtain the new birth. And those who don't believe are condemned. I'll read verse 36 again here. It says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So that's just another concise summary of the teaching on the new birth. So what's happening in these last verses of John 3 basically is this. John the Baptist is sharing the good news. He's sharing the gospel of the new birth to any who can hear. And John, the apostle, who's writing all of this down, well, we know that why he's writing it. As he says in John 20, verse 31, he says that he's writing it that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so with that in mind, let's just go back for a second to our root question that we started everything off with. How do we enter the kingdom of God? How do we enter heaven? Well, if we sift through what the world says and we listen to the one who came down from heaven, uh, we hear the true answer. To enter heaven, we need to be born again of God. And this happens by believing. No human works can cut it. So the question I pose to you then as we close is, is simple. Do you believe? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Are you born again? It's the most important question we can possibly ask. And for those that that maybe are answering that question today and and the 
the, the answer is honestly no. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God would open your eyes to see that you need him. And you do. You do need God. And I want you to know that, that God so loved you that he sent Jesus to die for you. Your sins have been paid for. So please, please put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe. And to those of you who answered yes to being born again, I, I want to challenge you. Be like John the Baptist. Be a narrator of the new birth. There are so many souls around us who are lost. So many people that don't believe that Jesus is the one way to heaven. But you know the good news. You know that truth, that to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again of God. So tell that good news to others. I'm not being overdramatic by saying that that could be the difference between life and death. There's a reason that Jesus has given us the command that he did to share the good news. And we need to walk in obedience to that command. We need to be narrators of the new birth. And finally, as an encouragement as well for those of us who, who have answered that question, yes, about being born again. I pray that we're continually reminded of this good news and that it would cause us to praise our Lord with thanksgiving that we know him. I love how 1 Peter chapter 1 begins in verse 3, and I'll, I'll close with this. It begins with praise. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this good news. Lord, and, and we pray that, uh, that we would all remember, whether we're born again now or not, that the new birth is necessary. We can't enter heaven on our own. We need to be born again. And in order to be born again, we must believe. Because, Lord, without you, we're dead in our sin. But we know that the new birth brings new life in us. And you've given us that gift because you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross. And Lord, for those of us who know that truth, I pray that we would tell that truth to others. And for those who don't know it, Lord, I pray that you would be working in those people. You'd open their eyes, Lord. You'd have mercy on them that they would know and see their need for you. That, Lord, they too would be able to, to enter heaven one day. We thank you for your word, Lord, and, and that it speaks this life to us. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.